Um, I, I'll start with the first question. Um, uh, the question is why were the negative outliers removed and was this requested by the industry and could this cover some effects they would rather uh, keep in? Yeah, so we did not, we only reduced uh, um, rather um, the outliers that we looked at removing were the negative ones. Um, so this was kind of instances where we think the calculations maybe went um, not as anticipated. Um, there's some instances, because uh, remember all the data was collected back in 2007. So this was a very new process at that time um, and trying to account for the concentration in the barns, account for an ambient concentration outside to be able to attribute an emissions rate to the barn itself. Um, there's some subtraction going on in there and so negative numbers could occur. Um, what we were seeing were some very extreme negative numbers um, in some of our pollutants, I think. Um, and we were just trying to remove the ones that were very large, like, I mean, they were on the order of 100, 200 grams per day, um, negative values that were coming out of the bar. Yeah, so it was like, these are these are not right kind of numbers. Um, we did leave in uh, the process um, and it's outlined in one of the appendices in the reports was basically look at um, what the median rate value was of the positive values. And then we multiply that by kind of the percentage error that goes with the monitor that was used to collect that pollutant um, in order to kind of get what we thought was a reasonable error range for that value or for that pollutant. Um, and then we kind of trimmed off anything that was excessive from that. Um, and that is to say, I think for any one animal type, it only really cut off one or two points um, that were way far kind of out from any of the other measurements. And we did that just so it wouldn't um, artificially um, reduce the emissions that are being predicted by the model. Because um, that's what those extreme negative values were we were seeing um, in some of our initial pushes with the modeling. And that was probably a little more detail. I'm sorry, I've done this for too long. I love to get into the weeds with it. Um, but that's what it was. It was not on a request of um the industry it was something we actually took to the sab with our first um the science advisory board with our first um effort in 2012 we noticed there were a lot of negatives some data sets were better than others um and we were kind of asking them um how we should handle this as far as an outlier removal and that was a process we came up with based on all of their comments Thank you. Thank you, Evan. And, and the audience appreciates the, the, the details. Uh, also, uh, both Ian and Bill, if there's any any yes. interest in chiming in, please feel free to unmute and join us. Um, uh, moving on to the next question. Um, um, how do you, we participate in the public comment portion of this timeline? I yes. think you may have laid it out, but please. Yeah, some of them. yeah just one more time. Um, and you'll have all the links in the slides um, after the talk. But um, yeah, you will have, everything will get posted to the AP42 website. Feel free to read through the documents at your leisure. Any kind of comment you would like to make on them, you email the EPA, um, the chief AP42 um, email address, which is like comments at epa.gov. It's on the slide. Um, yeah, any type of however you want to send the comments, if they're just brief comments and you want to put them in the body of the email, that's great. If you want to put them in a Word document, kind of as you read through things, if you're going through at that level, awesome. I will read them. I promise you, I read them all. <laughs> and um, we'll kind of aggregate them and um, respond to them um, as, as necessary within the documents and make some adjustments to how we're presenting things. Excellent. Um, maybe a, a small question relative to this. It really is the question relates to the slides and will they be available after the webinar? And the answer is yes. So a lot of the links uh, will be available there as well. Um, another question is the, um, and, and again, the asker said it may have been addressed already, but would like to get mm -hmm. on an e the email list, uh, the email list to, to receive a notification when the drafts are ready. Um, yeah. So um, is, is that a specific uh, mail list or uh, how to get on that list? There are a couple of methods to do it. Like I said, you can get on the chief listserv and they will email you when it's available. Um, or you can do the listserv for the Agricultural Information Center. Um, if you really, 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 really want to make sure you get everything, um, 
you can submit your email address to the names at epa.gov email address and I'll put you on our comms plan um, when I send everything out to um, all the state MGOs um, and um, our industry partners. You'll just be on the BCC list too. Perfect. And that's names in AEMS at epa.gov. Yes. Yes, we put the E in the other, the wrong spot, but that's how we say it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, the following question is, if I use the calculation web tool, will the information I input become public? And will the tool have form identifying information? No. Um, thank you for asking this question. Um, I always forget to mention this. We save none of the data. All of that data is saved on your local browser cache. And none of it gets submitted to EPA. We in no way, shape, or form have access to it. It is all just personally on your PC and if and saved in the web browser. There is, and I forgot to mention that too, a way for you to export it into um, an Excel um, file in case um, you want to save it so you can prove that you did the calculations and you're below. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't save anything. Sorry. <laughs> I always forget to mention that. We yeah, we're not collecting any of your information. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the following uh, question before is... Before you go on, could sorry. I just, in one particular, two particular instances, maybe, um, if you're signed up for the agreement, you're required to submit something in response to having done the calculations per the model. So um, the, the web tool won't be publicly available, but you may have to take the outputs from that and submit it, which which may be publicly available at some point in time. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, and the same thing with EPCRA, if that ever comes back to pass and you have to do a calculation for EPCRA, you can use the tool and then you would have to submit that to your state or local emergency planner. Um, so that may become publicly available then as well. So um, we're not keeping the information as part of the tool, but you may be responsible for, for putting it somewhere where it could become publicly available then. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think a uh, question, another question uh, on web tool, if the manure in storage, regardless if there are animal animals not in the barn for two weeks. So essentially uh, a manure in storage, but not animals in the barns. There is still air emissions from pit fans. This is the question. Yes, yes, and um, that's um, those days were considered in the model development. So, um, within our data set, we had instances where we had, like, say, from a swine operation, um, days where the bar or the barn was empty, um, so it had zero inventory, but it still had emission numbers, and so those values were input into the model um, as part of the calculation. So the model should produce an answer for um, days with zero um, inventory and still produce an emission value based on the empty house. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question is, are you tracking VOCs in air emissions? Yes, we will have um, some emission factors for VOCs. They are more like emission factors and not um, models. Um, they're not as sophisticated, that linear model. Um, the data was just not there to support that at this time. Um, but there will be emission factors in the AP according to chapter for VOCs. Thank you. Um, moving on with the following question. Are there abatement strategies from emissions that will be included in the tool? Um, not at this time. That's what I, that last kind of like limitation I was discussing was. Um, we're leaving those up to the state and local permitting authorities to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, those are those instances where if you have literature to support that, say I put this amendment on my letter and I know it gives me a 80% reduction in ammonia emissions. Um, that's documentation you can take to your permitting authority if you need to uh, pursue a permit to kind of get those um, emission levels uh, adjusted for your permit. Thank you. Um, another question relates to the ammonia emissions. And the question is, are you tracking ammonia emissions as a precursor to particulates? Um, do I, um, Yes and no. I, I, I don't know how to particularly answer this. Um, all the pollutants that were to be tracked for names and monitored under names were decided at the start of the process. Um, I know ammonia is of concern for um, Epcot and Circula, so I think that was one of the primary reasons they were included 
in um, the initial study and um, the study design, um, but it is also a precursor for PM2.5 and, and also odor nuisance issues. So um, these models can be used kind of on all of those ends to help improve, um, like I said, inventories for say more complex modeling like the CMAC modeling um, or um, any other modeling to support efforts for um, secondary formation of PM. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, so the answer is kind of like yes and no. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a lot of designs behind all of this. Absolutely. Thank you, Evan. I think the following question, you, you've addressed it. It relates to the storage of the data privately stored yes, or removed yes. on a hub. The data is locally stored on the yes. users and the data is not used as a, in any reporting purposes that the user will not need yet. to import and submit separately in however they are required to submit. Um, which CAA requirements might be triggered? Um, at this point, um, we're primarily looking at any kind of permitting um, requirements. Um, again, it would be like operating permits, um, new source review, um, prevention of significant deterioration, so PSD permits. Um, all those are, are applicable um, under the air consent agreement. I think some of our back of the envelope calculations suggest it's mostly um, some of the thresholds. The biggest threshold um, that's applicable to um, our the animal feeding operations would be the PM2 and a half standard and potentially the VOC standard, um, but they're set at um, levels um, that we think most of the um, operations that might have to pursue permitting would be in non-attainment areas where those thresholds are significantly lower um, going forward. Because I think the standard for a um, Maintenance area is 250 tons per year of PM2.5. Um, so that's kind of a significant number, um, uh, particularly with these sources. So um, like I said, it. I think, yeah, that's the main Clean Air Act requirement that we've been focusing on as we've kind of been queuing everything is that PM2.5 level for permitting. Thank you. Um, the following question asks, are the manure sheds included in the model? Yes, we have a manure sh shed um, for layer operations um, that we developed a model for. Um, there was a shed that was part of the study. We have data for that. Um, I think that's another hope of ours moving forward, um, kind of after we get this chapter out and fulfill our part of the consent agreement is to perhaps expand that to manure sheds on um, other types of operations. On. Thank you. Um, has EPA determined how large a livestock facility would need to trigger uh, the Title V major source uh, thresholds? I have not specifically done that calculation yet. We're trying to make sure we've got those models pinned down and kind of closer to what they're going to be final before we try to do that back calculation for a number. Um, the calculations themselves, I do want to reiterate at this point, um, are on a per house basis. So depending on how your total animal population is divided up among houses that might affect um, your emissions level. And that's some more sensitivity analysis that we need to do um, as we move towards that final analysis. But I think that was our thought was to have some kind of um, indication um, when we go out for final. Thank you. Um... I think the following question is, more or less similar. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll read another list and leave it to your judgment, Bevan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it relates to the EPA perspective on the federal CAA implications after the EP42 is finalized. Essentially, a fee animal feeding operations be subject to um, permitting requirements for potential emissions. Um, I will say yes. Um, I, I, it's, it's possible. Um, like I said, I haven't done all the back album calculations to kind of determine how large a facility would have to be and where they would have to be to reach in the permitting calculations, but we do believe it's within the realm of possibility. Um, again, I, I the bottom part of that question I see is about fugitive emissions seems really important here. Uh, we, we concur and that'll be part of our guidance that we, um, are developing currently with, um, our permitting group, um, like I said, it'll be consistent with any other fugitive um, guidance that has been released by the agency. We'll just make sure we'll put it in the context of 
uh, animal agriculture and be able to say like specific sources we think would generally be considered fugitive and these general sources would be considered generally considered fugitive. Um, but again, a lot of those decisions we made on a um, case by case basis by the permitting authority, uh, just because they'll need the um, site specific facts in order to make those very specific de determinations. But we will have some rules of thumb to kind of go along with everything. Thank you. Um, a question related to beef operations and why they were not included in names. Uh, they didn't sign up for the agreement. I think that's the simple answer, right, Bill? Yeah, I'll add a little more to that. They're, as a group, they decided they did not want to participate, so they encouraged their, uh, their farmers and producers not to sign up. Um, part of the sign up was as Bevan indicated, you know, paying into a fund to fund the study itself. So if they only had a few sign up, they wouldn't have enough money to fund their study. Um, and so, yeah, beef and turkey, they had some want to sign up, but not enough that could fully fund the study. So um, we did not do the data collection part on the, on the you know, behalf of beef or, or turkey. So they didn't get um, any methodologies developed. So it was, for beef specifically, they they sort of chose not to participate. And so it was a voluntary consent agreement and they didn't have to sign up and they chose not to for the most part. Thank you. Um, the following question, is it correct to assume that all the emissions that the web tool can be used to estimate would be considered point source emissions and not fugitive? Um. I'm going to defer answering this question because um, we'll address it in the guidance and kind of um, approach how we're going to define what's fugitive um, and non-fugitive. We're providing that method in which to um, get estimates regardless of whether it's fugitive or non-fugitive. Um, and again, um, some of those definitions will even vary again on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the specific facts for the particular facility. So, sorry to give you a non-answer. No, no, that's... <laughs> I, I but guess it's, it's a very and I uh, and I've, I've kind of developed my understanding of this and talking with our permitting group. It's a very nuanced question sometimes whether it's a fugitive or not. Um, particularly with what we're dealing with animal feeding operations because there's so much variety in um, different sources based on the region, based on um, the animal, just the practices on the farm itself. And so we're again going to try to create some rules of thumb that um, the local permitting authorities can use to kind of make those des determinations or at least assist in those. Um, but again, it's going to be based on the facts and how those individual operations are actually run. Um, and the tool is just there designed to provide, um, I know they're very hairy statistical equations, so we're just trying to provide a mechanism that people can get that estimate out of there so they can use it for um, um, these purposes, whether it's future or not. Thank you. Um, the next question relates to BACT or BACT and LAER okay. will be included layer will be included in that guidance document. Um, we have had discussions around BACT and layer for that um, the final guidance, which is the other reason why we're not pushing it out until the end because we wanted a little more time to talk about that um, and make those determinations or whether we should be making those determinations um, in this document. Okay, and BACT and layer for the uninitiated are. Um, best available control technology yep. and layer is. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. Blanking on layer. <laughs> I think it's lowest achievable emission Perfect. reduction. Perfect. I was Thank blanking you. on the owl. I couldn't think of it. I appreciate that. Um, the following model uh, question actually relates to can the model handle multiple animal types? Yes, the tool is developed to say if. Um, you have an operation that has both a swine component and a layer component. Um, you can do the calculations at the same time and it will give you a big facility emission total at the end. Excellent. Um, the following question, how do I find out if my integrator signed me up for an air consent agreement? That was a long time ago. <laughs> yes, we have been. This is not the first time I've heard this question. I will tell you what um, our last conversation with OECA was. Um, we are 
trying to determine a way that we can share that information that does not release any personally identifiable information along with that information. Um, as you know, a lot of the farms, um, you provide your, they provided their address at sign up, um, but smaller farms, that's also the farmer's real address. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a way, basically if we released all of that so people could determine if their farm signed up, we'd be doxing some farmers, um, which we distinctly do not wanna do in this day and age. Um, it's just bad form. So we're trying to figure out a way where we can present that information with enough identifying information that people can uh, determine if their farm was signed up, say if the farms changed hands or maybe changed names, um, whether it's still covered um, under the air consent agreement. Um, I think those conversations are ongoing. I will note that the Environmental Advisory Board did approve um, all of the um, submittals to participate. Um, and those are publicly available. They are kind of a shorter list. Um, you can Google, it's like EAB, Environmental Advisory Board, um, Air Con AFO Air Consent Agreement, and they should come up. I think we're working on kind of consolidating that list and having that available to look, because I think it just identifies the farm by name and state. So there's no address in there. Um, I think that's where we left it. We're still working on that. I will, um, if that becomes available, we will put it on the project website so that way people can access it. Thank you. Um, the next question um, from Brandon, how does the data collected represent states like Arizona, which has distinct regional differences from the rest of the data sample? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what, what part of what we did with the exploratory data analysis too was to look at the range of values that we had emissions present for. I think I made a small comment about this while I was talking. And what basically that meant was we were trying to make sure that we had uh, combinations of meteorological parameters with emissions that matched more than just the region that the farm was located in. So particularly for Arizona, making sure that we had representation of kind of hotter temperatures and drier conditions um, and emission values at those levels to kind of make sure that the model can extend out um, that far with its um, emission estimates and it's not too far, it's not an extrapolation for the model to get to those, that temperature and relative humidity range when it's doing predictions. Um, our initial testing is that it should be, um, represent uh, Arizona uh, within the model. It's not, a, like I said, it's not an extrapolation point for the model. Um, we will, as I said, um, moving forward after we get this final chapter out, um, look to improve the models by expanding the data that's used in them and kind of rerun them as we get that data. So um, if we can get data for a study um, out in Arizona um, or say somewhere in the desert Southwest in general, not to call out Arizona, um, but we can add that data into the model, reprocess it, and then um, we'll publish an update to the model itself to make sure um, we're extending um, across that whole range um, and not, and also um, for colder temperatures as well. So we're not just calling out uh, desert Southwest people, but um, even in the Northern tier, if we're missing some data with say colder temperatures, we Thank can you. add those in later. Um, I think the following question relates to the, uh, the time between the monitoring and today. So the monitoring was done quite a time while ago and yes. there are, are there concerns or perspectives on potential gaps because of the changes in operations. Yeah, uh, I mentioned one during the presentation with the cage-free operations, we are aware that the industry has started to make a shift towards uh, more cage-free operations and then also um, kind of more of the, um, you know, free range, um, even past, you know, you know, even more space than, um, than the cage-free houses. Um, and like I said, we're looking at um, how we can fill that data gap kind of um, after this initial push to fulfill the consent agreement. Um, and we'll look across all the animal types at that point um, to see if there are um, data for um, or practices that need to be included now that maybe weren't as prevalent um, back when we started doing the data collection in 2007. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, we have quite a bit of questions, but <laughs> we're, we're making a dent. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, the following question relates to the um, the particulate emissions. Um, so, do the model the models in general account for particulate emissions from the movement of the animals? We looked at this. Um, this is a great question. Um, there were um, 
activity monitors placed in the barns. We do have some limited data on this account. We did not incorporate them in the models at this time. We kind of used, excuse me, other information to act as a proxy, if you will, for kind of animal movement. Um, again, uh, things like temperature, if it's hotter in the barns, then um, they might not be moving as much as for comfort. Um, and that was kind of how we dealt with it right now. That is something we're looking at as um, a way to incorporate uh, as something to incorporate in the models. I think the hang up with that is how to estimate that um, for a farmer and have that as an input um, for future models. And I think that's why we tabled it for right now until we could come up with a really um, creative and perhaps easy way for that information to be included. Thank you. I'll jump in there with just a quick addition to that. Um, for PM, I mean, the, the data were collected continuously on a 24 seven basis. So, from the standpoint that the, all PM emissions are generally generated from the movement of the animals or whatnot. Um, we've collected all those PM emissions, not just, you know, when the animals are active. So, um, so we've got this time scale of when animals are moving, when they're not moving. And so the data that we use to develop the models includes both of those things. We just don't try to connect their movements to the actual emissions on a smaller time scale. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was just going to add that um, that sometimes you know because it, these are models that predict daily emissions, so we're looking you know the there might be a, a diurnal or dial uh, animal activity variation, um, but also um, you know that they can change the activity can change with weight as the animal grows as well. So that's uh, another factor. Thank you. Um, the, the next question, I suspect it's it's, it's uh, involved. Uh, there's quite a bit of details there, but uh, it relates to the validation of the calibration process. It really is wanting a clarification or of how were the validation and calibration processes carried out. For the models or for the monitoring? Excellent question. Um, I don't I think we say, have enough time to go into yeah, all I was the say, details. I don't think we have enough time to go into all the details of that. I will say that the site monitoring reports and the data, so that would include the data collection methodologies and the validation calibration criteria for the initial data collection um, are posted on uh, the EPA's website. Um, I think there's a link or at least directions on how to get to them from our project website if you're interested kind of in the nitty gritty of those um, details. Um, for the models we did validate, we used secondary data. We had some um, data that was withheld from a secondary study. Um, so we didn't use it in model development, but we withheld it for model validation. So we did actually do some calculations to see how well the model would predict on data it's never seen before. Um, and we did standard model performance um, statistics on that. Um, and there should be plots and everything um, in the revised version. I don't it was not in the swine. This is another improvement that we made. So it's starting in layers and later there should be, um, <laughs> this is how deep I'm in this. It should be chapter eight of the report itself should have all that information um, if you wanna go into that. And we do a couple different um, data, data validation steps and, for the models and that's all laid out in there. Excellent. So that's for both the primary data from the monitoring as well as for the model uh, developed. Yes. I'll give you two for one on that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we may have time for maybe one or two questions. With the remaining remaining questions, we'll we'll get answers from you okay. and and we we'll upload. Um, the next question is: If data is not saved, how can citizens learn about pollution in our communities? And maybe um, yeah. yeah, that's I I respect that question. I understand where that's coming from. Um, I will say that, um, like I've said before, this is not the end of all of this. We are working closely with our emissions inventory group to how to utilize this information with their reporting um, and their reporting that goes into the national emissions inventory, um, which is something that people can access and improving the estimates of emissions from individual farms that would go into that inventory. Um, so that would be a mechanism. Um, again, if um, they, if, um, EPRA um, reporting comes back, that'll be another mechanism in which um, the public can get access to this information as well, as far as what the estimated emissions are coming off of these farms. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is, will you include methane under volatile uh, organic compounds or VOCs? And I've been trying to remember this. I've read this question about five minutes ago and I've been trying to remember, I don't think the VOC measurements we have include methane. Um, so there, and there was no supplemental methane data collected across the study. Um, so the short answer is no, unfortunately. Perfect. Um, maybe that will be our final question. Um, the, the question is, um, so to be clear, if the data upon which the model was created was without BMPs in place, and a facility does have BMPs in place, the model has no way to calculate the reduction. Are there any plans to standardize the expected reductions from specific BMPs? Um, okay, so to start from the beginning, yes, the data on which the model was developed was uncontrolled emissions. So all the farms, if they had best management practices in place, like litter amendments, they did not do those over the course of the study. Um, there, within the models themselves, there's no way to add that percentage reduction um, to account for any best management practices or control technology. Excuse me, as I said, um, that's something that for all other stationary sources, so um, is always decided at a, um, by the local permitting authority. I think um, what we're hoping to do is have some standard ranges of what control measures usually are for the typical control measures um, that could be placed on these facilities um, like litter amendments. But again, we provide a range because um, we know there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a wide breadth of control level that you can get from different um, formulations, particularly of litter amendments. Um, and we wanna be able to offer um, that flexibility both to the operators and to our um, local permitting authorities to make those um, those calls um, on the exact emission reductions that they can apply to those facilities.